I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's Story Survive program with Elizabeth Belak and her daughter, Alexandra Belak, who's with her. Uh, moderated by the wonderful Broadway actress, Stephanie Lynn Mason, who you may know from her leading roles in Fiddler on the Roof and Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish. Uh, we'll dive into Elizabeth's story today, so I won't introduce her in too much detail now, but I just want to say what an honor it is for us to have her with us uh, and uh, a very special Mother's Day to all the mothers and daughters who are tuning in. Um, we're, glad, we're glad you're here with us today to hear this story. So please feel free to share questions in the Zoom Q&A box or comments in the Zoom chat throughout the discussion. Uh, Stephanie will interview Elizabeth and then we'll save some time towards the end for audience Q&A. Without further ado, uh, take it away, Stephanie. Hi, everyone. I just want to thank you for inviting me. And yes. I'm very honored. Yes, thank and you I want so to much. Wish everybody happy Mother's Day. Too. Yes, thank you so much for having me as well. And happy Mother's Day to Elizabeth, and happy Mother's Day to everyone watching out there. Um, I am so honored to be here today and that you're willing to talk to me about your life before, during, and after the war and about your family, especially your sister Renya, but all of your other relatives that you lost in the Holocaust. So I'm so honored and thank you so much for being here with me I'm and everyone. Happy everyone's. to see you too. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful to see you. It's wonderful to see you too. Um, it's been so wonderful getting to know you and also reading about you. And I love knowing that also you're a fellow actor or you're a fellow actress. And I love finding out that you were the Polish Shirley Temple oh. before the war. Um, how did you come to be interested in the arts? I have to ask. <laughs> well, I, what, it wasn't me. My mother used to read stories to us and also read poems to us. And I would memorize it. I was only five years old. Oh my and so, yeah, so I used to know whatever she read. So she said, gee, you must have an interest in uh, poetry. I said, oh, yes, I like it. So when I was five years old, I was on the radio in the city of the roof. Oh my and goodness. my sister was too, because we were reciting poems. So I started at a very young age that I, you know, didn't know I was famous then, you know, like the Polish Shirley Temple and all <laughs> these magazines. But my mom introduced me to all that when I was very young. And my sister, she noticed that she was a good writer because she was six years older. Wow. So, you know, um, she was doing the writing and this, and I guess my mother helped her. But me, she just, oh, yeah, you know, so <laughs> of course, that's how it started. Um, do you have a favorite memory of being a child actor in Poland? Like one of your favorite well, movies? Yeah, I was with some famous actress in that movie, Gehenna. She was one of the, I think her name was Trzeczynska or something. And, you know, me as a kid going with all these famous people, it, it, you know, it uh, very much impressed me. I must say, I was just seven, eight years old. Oh I was, uh, how, you know, it was so different when they made the movie and that camera and the whole thing. It's nothing like today. The technology was so different. But of course, you know, those people in the movies were handsome people, beautiful. And I was very impressed because when I was in Cyrulik Warszawski, when I was reciting the poetry, it was different. You know, there wasn't much, there was a big man, there's a picture, I don't know, he was another actor, but that was different than the movies. The movie was really something else for me. Oh, wow. I've had the honor of seeing photos of you from when you were a child actress, and I know we have some of them. Can we show the viewers some of these um, videos? So um, you had told me a story about the buttons on your dress in this. Can yeah. you share that with us? So the buttons, uh, my name is here, Ariana. I was born, and my name is Elizabeth Bellack. I was born Ariana Spiegel. But for uh, art and, uh, you know, the stage, they called me Ariana. So each button has a letter that it says to the end, Ariana. Amazing. Can we go to the next photo? 
These are some of your news clippings, right? From when you were? Yes. Uh, so this man was also an actor from somewhere. He was with me at Cerurik uh, Varsaski. And this other thing it says, Ariana Polska Shirley Temple. And it, also, it was from this that we found out things because when the war came, I forgot I was on the stage, you understand? Mm -hmm. Everything closed up. I was with my grandparents. They never had any clips or this is all my mother had with when she lived on the German side, mm -hmm. you know, because I was in Warsaw on the stage. And it also said I was in these two movies and they found out that one movie that there is a clip here somewhere that I was in the movies and the movie was called Gehenna. Yes. <laughs> it's right here. I don't think I was inspired by Shirley Temple. I just like to do what I like to do. So my mom, I just thought I'd be a movie star. Well, I didn't have curly hair. <laughs> <laughs> my hair was straight. I curled it now, but I didn't And it looks it. beautiful, by the way, oh, I must say. Hey, it's um, thanks to my daughter who dyes my hair curls. <laughs> I found a new profession. She has a new profession. <laughs> Absolutely. So I have to ask, what are some of your other memories from life before the war with your family? And what, what were things like? Oh, we had a very happy, as my sister writes in the book, we were very happy kids. We lived in a country of my father stayed in the middle of nowhere. It just was horses, cows, chickens, so on and so forth. There was a smith who fixed the horses, who hoped the horses and so on. So, you know, our life was good. In the summertime, my mother took us to a town called Salishchiki on the very border of the, uh, you know, Romania. It was just a river called Dniestr. We lived on the Polish side and then they made the railroad and it went to, what? Well, that's the river right here. My sister, my mom and I by the river Dniestr on the other side is Romania. And my mom used to go, we had a quick, you know, guy with the horses used to take us to town. She would buy sugar, salt, this and that, what she needed for the house. And, you know, we used to have, uh, actually, when there was summertime, they had a, a how would I say, they had a, this place of uh, the summer festival mm -hmm. in that town. And so we would perform. We had these Polish costumes with the boys. We met the, the what Burmish is, um, mayor of the town. It was very pleasant for us. Our, we had beautiful trees at home. We had fruit at home. With the birds were singing, my sister writes, the wind was blowing. She was so poetic and she put it all in her words. I loved it. I mean, it was a good life. Absolutely. Um, I had the honor of reading from Renya's diary and the museum streamed 18 Candles event a few months ago. Um, and I was so incredibly moved by her words and her story. What was your relationship with her like? And did you know she was keeping a diary? No, I never know she was keeping a diary. I had no idea. She must have kept it under the bed or somewhere. I didn't know about the diary till Zygmunt brought it to New York and found my mom. But right. I didn't read the diary till a few months ago, I finished. And it was the last few, yeah. I tried to translate the diary with this friend of ours. He was a Polish man. He translated his book about the Polish uprising. And we used to go to Florida and I would try to, you know, start it. Every time I tried, I started to cry. I couldn't get, I just couldn't do it. So I never really read the diary. My mother never did read the diary. I just finished reading in Polish the diary wow. a few months ago. Now I started to read it in English because my heart was always breaking to read it, you know? It's very difficult. And the last chapter that I finally read, I see that she was scared. 
there was something there, premonition, that, you know, something bad was coming. Well, of course, it was you get in the ghetto and you get taken out, you know, things aren't good. You know, she had to, we had to wear the band. I was too young to wear it, but she did, you know. I'm sorry. But, you know, <laughs> that's how it was. Life was great and suddenly everything changes like in five minutes. The Russians arrive. Life is different, different. Um, what was your relationship like with Renya? Were you close as sisters? Oh, well, she, she was my surrogate mother. Mm. When I think about it, yeah, I didn't have a mother. I was a young kid and I was always with my mom. And it was very difficult. And of course, the Russians arrived. I was with the older grandparents. There were all the people. I was young. The difference is great. And, you know, it was very difficult for me. And there were these Russians coming, you know, with the Menashka. They had this one top dish. They ate with one thing in it. They marched in to Semish, where I was with my grandparents. And everybody was scared. It was a new army. It was something totally different. And us kids, you know, uh, surprised. Uh, what? Uh, and of course, uh, the, the Germans were approaching the other side and this and that. And this, this town was a division with the Germans and the Russians. Right. With the River Sun, that was the River Sun in that town. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, how old were you around this time? Maybe around ten or nine, maybe. I I was going to school. The Russians let the Jews go to school, because the Germans never let you go to anything. They just tried to kill you. But uh, the Russians. They let us to go to school. They want us to grow up with commies, right? The kids can be molded. It's a different story. Right. They used to wear this harsh to called Sigdagator, always ready. So, you know, maybe we would become that. We didn't know anything about it, but we went to school. I went to elementary. My sister went to gymnasium. She was six years older. Right. Um so the difference between the Russian occupation and the German occupation, as that shifted, what changes were happening around you at the time? And as a 10 year old, what did that feel like? Well, first of all, you know, we were running away from the German, my grandfather, my sister and I, my grandmother stayed with the maid in town. She wasn't going anywhere. And we had a terrible trying going the Russians were, Germans were already bombing Chemish. We were running through the fields. We were running away to another town. We didn't know what to do, you know. People were running. But um, we, we knew because when the Russians arrived, the family of my grandmother from Yaroslav all came to Chemish running away from the Germans because they knew for the Jews that was it. But when the Russians came now at the Germans, that was we knew we were stuck and who knows what's going to be. We lived still about a year in our building where my grandpa and grandma lived. But then, of course, we were going to get them. We couldn't go to school. We had to wear a band. We had to be petrified who was talking on the street. Uh, our life changed enormously. Everybody was petrified. And of course, we couldn't go to school. That was taboo. But I had a girlfriend, and she would meet me, the one whose father saves my life. Mm. Um, that, you know, under the death penalty. But this is Mr. Lestinsky, and his sister, His he had three daughters. The, my best girlfriend was his youngest daughter. And the two other girls went to school with my sister and helped her actually. Uh, she had beautiful books, two books that were illustrated with poetry that you probably didn't see it separate. We have it. Mm. And, and so they were very friendly and he belonged to the organization. 
to help the Jews. That's absolutely. But you know, you were petrified walking on the street. The Germans start taking the coats away, the fur coats. They took the piano, they this, they that. I mean, they came to the house. You had to keep paying, I don't know what. It was a terrible situation. Absolutely. I remember reading in the diary about when they took the piano away and just how... With the heart everyone, broken, yes. Her heart my broken. My used to send us... Well, she sent my sister to a special professor under the Russian, and he used to teach that the Polish. You know, her writing is beautiful in Polish. It's hard to translate. Those poetry are very difficult to translate. <laughs> and it's beautiful. <laughs> Even in English, it's so, so, so beautiful. You know, um, every time that there was some trouble, she would write. If she loved somebody, she writes. If she was unhappy, she writes. If the school asked her to write, she was president of the Her Literary Club. She was just a brilliant girl. I and she also helped my grandfather in his business. She used to write all his proposals, whatever. So she was young, 15, so grown up for her age. I was younger. So incredibly mature for her age. And so she had so much promise and so many dreams. Um, I have to ask, what was it like being taken to the ghetto with your family? And what was your understanding of what was happening? And I know that Renya was like a second mother to you. And what was, um, what, was she there for you during that time? How did she support you? You know, they had to give the money. First time the policeman came for us to go, I think my grandfather bribed him, so we stayed a little more. And then, you know, everybody after a year, they got a little place. You know, here my grandparents lived in that building all their lives. And suddenly, you know, my grandma had the store downstairs and my grandpa had his business in the room there and a big desk and my sister helped him. And he was, you know, construction stuff and that. And so it, it, we had to move now. First they took the coats and then they took the piano. Then we had to obviously lose our maid. And, you know, we got a little small place. They had a little yard outside, you know, but actually we didn't stay there very long because my sister gets killed. But, you know, she gets, goes to school under the Russian. She falls in love with Zygmunt. Zygmunt is a great guy. My God. He was in five camps and surviving. He had dark, dark hair, beautiful green eyes, curly hair. Oh, she, he was an adorable guy and very pleasant. He came to the house. He used to sit under this big, there was a big stove made of, uh, what? Ceramic stoves, you know, they used to, we didn't have, uh, like here, a radiator. So we just had to put the fire into the stove. And, and so that's how we lived. And then Zygmunt was there. And of course, maybe he did know that she was writing the poems. But I had poetry. We, we, we only knew that she was literary. She was in a Russian newspaper. She got a ward with this Marcel Tuckman, who was a doctor here for 50 years. So Zygmunt became a doctor too. And when he was a doctor, he was in the Air Force here. Then he became a doctor in New York and found my mom and brought in this diary. Why we didn't ask him, where did you keep that diary? We never asked him wow. because we never knew it. You know what I mean? You meet somebody after so many years, you get so confused. <laughs> Oh, my sugar there. <laughs> and so you don't know what. And so we never asked the most important question. Where was the diary? Yes. And who kept it? We yes. thought that the diary arrived in New York, was given to Zygmunt. He found my mom. He copied the diary. And he had a shrine in his apartment, his house downstairs with my sister's picture. I don't know how his wife never much invited us, but we saw Zing. You know, it was hard for her. Yes. I was the sister of his great love. Yeah. Wow. And so we got this, and then he helps us at the end. So we go to that ghetto, 
we have the little place. You know how sad it is to say goodbye to the grandparents? My God, it was just heartbreaking. So he comes, I think, takes me first. What she does, how we get out of it? Because there was armed people at the gates, you know, when we were inside. I don't know what he did. He gets me out wow. and takes me to the family of Lischinsk. Now, from the ghetto. And then a few days later, he takes my sister and his parents wow. to a brother in a garage. Now, the brother is something in the Judenrat. He lives on the Aryan side. But mm. somebody rats on my sister. And, of course, they kill her. She's 18 in a few days. I don't know anything about it because Leszczynski now takes me to the railroad station to take me to my mom. I haven't seen him in years, right? Right. And, and what, so how, how long had it been since you'd seen your mother? I didn't before? see her for two years. She came a couple of times. She was on Zasanya, which means uh, over the San River. Some, somehow they smuggled us through, and we saw my mom a little bit at first. We knew he, she was alive first. We didn't know. And then he takes me to my mother, and there's this beret. She works now in the Hotel Europejski because she's educated in Vienna. She knows German. And she's assistant to the director who does everything in the hotel where the, all the uh, German officers reside. It's the Wehrmacht, not the SS. Wow. And she does everything. She goes to the German. Of course, we have a different name. Oh, not yet me. So then he takes me to Warsaw. Some, and it's dogs. And it's big shepherds, and it's the Gestapo, he holds me by the hand, you can imagine how I feel. I have nothing but a little uh, lunchbox, which the grandpa put gold dollar bills all around and they take it, you know. And he holds me and say, I'm his daughter. But when we arrived in Warsaw, a guy runs to the guy and says, you're bringing a Jewish child. Can you imagine how I feel? I think, uh -huh, that's my end now. But it isn't. He says to the guy now, you better get away or I'll kill you. So the guy <gasps> runs away. And he takes me to Bereda family, whose wife is really Jewish. And his great grand uncle is a cardinal of Poland and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And they introduce me. Then my mother comes and we see each other. Everybody crying. <laughs> hey, my God. Yeah. It's, it's everybody crying. You know, we see my mother first time. And of course, she has all those pictures that you see because she never moved, you know. Right. I come with nothing, a little coat and a little dress. That's it. Wow. How did your mom survive during this time? How did she, What did she do in order to survive? She's working all this time under false name. She gets baptized. She goes to church. She is uh, assistant to the director in this Hotel Europe. It's five-star hotel. And uh, she works and everything in German. She's a big shot, you know, in a way. It's the war. She's fluent in German. And there is a guy, vice president, but he doesn't know anything in German. His name is Kurz, which means short. And so he's a Volksdeutsch. That means, you know, he's part German but he's Polish. And my mother does that, and so she's able to survive. Now, how she's going to survive for me? How is the survival going to be? So the Rebereda family introduces us to Kazio Pijinski. He makes, gets some dead person papers. Now I'm Elizabeth Lestinska, and I get baptized Elizabeth Yaroslava Alicia. And I get, they get me this, that, and another, that Mrs. Berede is my godmother. And they shove me some kind of a, uh, I have to learn catechism. And they put me in the convent, different kinds. That's not easy, but you know, I was an actress. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just going to ask you, what was it like in the convent? I have to know. <laughs> well, I didn't know anybody. The nuns, of course, knew I was Jewish. 
because the bishop shall puts me in, the one who baptizes me. And they, of course, uh, very good people that they want to hide me there. So I, there's some picture we have, one picture that I'm up with all these girls. And I go to church and I do the hocus pocus, whatever that is. And I learn how to live. And then my mother is able to take me to the hotel because she lives far away from the hotel, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's called Jolie Bush. And I go to her now and go with her. She takes me from the convent. But one day, every Sunday, we go to the director to have a lunch dinner with this hotel, Hotel Europejski. And we're ready to go. And after the church, we go in the trolley car. And in front it says Nur für Deutsche, there is a chain, and then back it's the post. Suddenly all the Gestapo or whatever comes into the trolley and says everybody out from the, this called something called Wapanka. They're gonna go get these people, they have these big trucks, they're gonna go to work in Germany. They need workers because, you know, the Germans are at the front, they're fighting, so they need people. So my mother is talking to me German. The guys are standing with their guns. And she says in German, Yarusha, come here. Du kannst nicht da, da, da. So he thinks we're German and we're walking away. <gasps> I feel that maybe the guns are in me, but not. She's talking German. He's German. The others get shoved up on those cars and we escape. But we, all day long, they did that in Warsaw that day. And so we're going through the old city of Warsaw to finally walking, not right, walking till we get to the hotel in the okay. afternoon, late afternoon when they stop already. And I get sick. I get yellow jaundice. And the doctor comes and said it's from fright. So now the doc, the Pokoshinsky says to my mom, from today on, you live in the hotel, Hotel Europejski. We get a beautiful room. We bring all our schmatas there and we stay there. That's how we get saved for a while. That's amazing. I mean, I can't even... The thousand offices live there and the hotel is guarded by the German soldiers with the, with the guns. Both sides, a huge hotel for a block, you know, whole block. It's a Krakowski Przedmieście. It's beautiful now. We were there and they gave us a suite. What a gorgeous place. And they, you know, they fixed it up. It was bombed during the war. Um, yeah. That's absolutely incredible. And I can't even fathom all of the various feelings that you were going through. Oh, so people. many things, so many things every day. You have no idea. You never know when that somebody is not going to, you know, recognize you or say something or, you know, I go to completely, which means somebody's house to learn, uh, you know, Polish, whatever I'm learning. And, uh, you know, I still remember my poems. <laughs> Would you mind sharing one with us? <laughs> so there were two poems, poets in Poland. One was Jan Brzechwa and one was Julian Tubin. They were both Jews, but they all got christened. So I can tell you a little poem that I remember just a part. Właśnie po to wieprza pieprze, żeby mięso było lepsze. Ależ będzie gorsze pieprze, kiedy wieprza pieprze wieprze. This one was Jan Brzeszwa. And I can tell you was just part of another that w śpiewowicach w słynnym mieście przy ulicy Wesolińskiej mieszka sobie słynny śpiewak pan Trawisła. Tralaliński, jego żona tralalona, jego córka tralalówka, jego piesek tralalesek, jego kota tralalona i kotek jest i kotek, kotek zwieszy tralalotek. Oprócz tego jest papuszka, bardzo śmieszna tralaluszka. Okej, okay. <laughs> that's two wings poem. 
you know, I chose these two because they have funny ways that you can hear it. The first one, of course, is about Pepper. And uh, Peter Piper, and Peter the Piper, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> I can't even it and the second, but in Polish, it's hard. Pierce and Pierce. Piotr is Pierce, which is a name. <laughs> <laughs> and Tralaliski is a famous singer who lives, and that was two years ago. They both were tremendous. I went to both people's houses. They invited me after I used to recite their poetry. That's amazing. I'm so glad that you were, you know, able to stay safe during the war. Where were you when you found out that you were liberated, and what was that feeling like for you? So that this man, you know, this uh, German, officer. German officer falls in love with my mom. I don't know about it, where she goes, whatever. It's a huge hotel. There was 200 rooms or more. And uh, he says to my mother, Maria, it's very dangerous. The Polish uprising began. You have to flee Warsaw. So he gets us a, a, a um, Nazare, you know, a car, an ambulance with a big red cross on top. We packed a few things. He gives my mother all kinds of papers. And he says, take, puts us on this a car, in this car, this ambulance, and takes us to the German border. Now she has all the papers and he tells us that her destination is a town small in Austria. It's called Bad Gastein. And that Bad Gastein has thermal waters and all the German soldiers who are wounded are stationed there because they have tremendous amount of hotels. Each hotel has a red cross. And so we travel to the border and we take a train, they come and, you know, people and examine the papers. And my mom, of course, you know, she speaks perfect German. And we travel to Badgestein, we arrive. My mom finds this doctor who was in charge of that town. And he gives my mother a job as Maria Leszczynska. We live in Hotel Straubinger. She sits in front, like in a reception desk. And we meet this Countess Walterskirchen and we begin a new life under the Germans now. I mean, Austria, but it's German occupation. Mm -hmm. So we stay there about a year. We have a picture when, when you see Miss in the Alps. I think the young man has a picture. That's where we live for about a year. We go to church, you know, and so on. And that's where we get liberated. That's the town. Wow. You can imagine what a life now with the American. They're standing there. We can't believe it. They're not, they're moving the mouth. He said, they don't talk. He said, they're chewing gum. <laughs> First time in my life, I see somebody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and that's it. They give us candy, this and that. My God, what a thing to get there. But what a story, the whole thing. I mean, there's a million other things in it. You understand? Yes. Now right. we don't have to worry to be killed every minute. And my mother gets a job with the Americans. She speaks a little English. She speaks French, English, German, Polish, blah, blah, blah. So... Now we're going to look for somebody in America, my uncle, who is French. So my grandparents sent my mother to Vienna to study. So her German is perfect. My uncle gets sent to Caen on the north. Huh? And he becomes an engineer and an architect. He marries a French lady from the society now. Everybody's Catholic there. We don't know. He sends us papers in the Bremen to go to France. My mother doesn't want to stay in Europe. And my uncle's upset because we're the only person in this family alive, my mom, because we lost everybody. 
We don't know what happened to anybody. We know my sister got killed. Now I know my mother finally tells me in Warsaw because she goes looking for her with this von Anderle, but of course she can't find anything. And so she decides to find the cousin of my grandpa who lives in New York in New Rochelle and we get papers and she wants to start a new life because the life is so difficult. It was, she doesn't want to have a memory of it. We lost everybody. My father had three sisters and two brothers. And uh, my grandmother had family. You know, nobody, we know now we found two people somehow through the book that are alive. One is in Warsaw, one in California. I can't believe it that happened. <laughs> but we really have nobody except the French family. And of course, I have my family, my daughter, oh. <laughs> wonderful daughter. She's the one that's me mechanized the whole thing. She found the diary. She had it translated cursory, you know, from Poland, some young guy, paid him a few thousand dollars to find out what's about this diary that was in the vault, right? 70 years. So that was my next question. Um, when when did Zygmunt bring you the diary? Um, and, and Alexandra, what made you want to get the diary published? So first question is, we're living in a little a room on 90th Street in the west side. And my mother first sends me to a school, uh, Nazareth Academy in Pennsylvania. That's where I go to school because she has no room for me. But then I'm back to New York visiting and uh, somebody rings the bell downstairs. It's a walk up, just two floors. And it's Sigmund Schwarz. He brings the diary. He finds my mother, Nischinska, finds her in that little building, comes upstairs, hands her the diary. My mother is totally shocked. She never knows my sister wrote a diary. How did he get, well, she doesn't ask him, where'd you get the diary? How? He sends her the diary. He makes a copy. I told you he keeps it in his house here. And that's now the diary is my mother's hands. Oh. Now my daughter will tell you what happens, right? Oh. Well, first, I, I wanted to I, I want to thank the Museum of Jewish Heritage and Ari Goldstein for hosting and organizing this event and inviting my mother to tell and share her story. And to you, Stephanie Lynn Mason, a fellow thespian for participating in this Q&A. Uh, you've made this a very special Mother's Day for me. And as you all know, uh, the survivors of the Holocaust are getting up in age. But I'm young, <laughs> 90. Yet, you know, yet their, their stories and their voices are as important and relevant as ever. And the Museum of Jewish Heritage plays a cr critical role in um, uh, preserving these stories. And future generations um, will look to institutions like this one to better understand what happened to Jews during the Second World War and other um, histories of, of the Jews. So I want to thank the Museum of Jewish Heritage and happy Mother's Day to everyone. Uh, what was your question? Oh, how <laughs> oh, the diary, how the oh, diary yes, was, yes. was right, diary. Right. It was in the Yeah, the vault. it was in the vault. And, you know, my name is Alexandra Renata, and I was named after this beautiful and talented soul who um, is was unfortunately taken from us too early by the Nazis. And, you know, I was always curious, curious about my past and my heritage and why we had so few relatives. Um, so originally, the motivation for translating the diary was to find out who Renya was, what was she like, what was her life like, what could she teach me about my past. And then after reading the diary, 
I realized that this was a historical document that needed to be shared with the world. Um, scholars and historians have said that she was a promising literary scholar. And in fact, Anna Freilich, who's a professor of Slavic studies at Columbia said of the diary that this powerful diary is not only a historical document, but a true and outstanding work of literature. So knowing this made this experience bittersweet because now I know what kind of future she could have had and, and many like her. Um, so I wanted to identify with my personal history and where I came from and it put me in a larger human experience of the Holocaust. It um, made this historical tragedy relevant to me and it made me look at myself and my family and the world differently because now I was connected to this human catastrophe. And for the first time I had to come to terms with who I was. And I think this whole experience has sensitized me as a person and individualized me and so it's become a much much bigger uh much bigger situation for me than just wanting to know about my past um and how old were you when you found out about your mother's story would did, was, was that something that she told you from a young age or was it something you found out later in life well, i think people of my mother's generation didn't want to talk about no. her past i think my mother um, never talked to her I think she was reluctant to tell her story and unearth these painful memories as she harbored these dark secrets that were simply too difficult and painful to tell, which is why we're all so lucky to have her here because there are few who are still around and have the energy and capacity to do these things, to do these types of events who are first account witnesses to the atrocities of the war. So she's here alive and vibrant. And while her story may be difficult to share, she never forgot her past. I think she just put it aside so that she could continue and forge a life for herself here. And I think she realizes that this story has so much more relevance and um, Well, than I ever. finally read this story. <laughs> And may I ask, like, so um, you finally read it. What were your thoughts about it? And how did you feel reading your sister's words? And did you re did the memories resonate with you? Did it bring memories back that you hadn't thought about? Sorry, those were a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I was heartbroken. I couldn't really read it. You know, it was so hard. I cried those poems and everything is a poem to me. I remember how we lived, how wonderful she was. She was so romantic. She loved life. She liked the birds sing. She liked the wind blow. She saw the, as uh, you know, the rainbow. She saw every beauty in everything, my sister. I mean, she was just great. And, you know, when she met that Zygmunt who was so good to her, that's how we got this book. You know, otherwise we wouldn't be here, right? I mean, we wouldn't be here today without this book. And so she was so interested. And then, of course, we started a new life here. I got married to George. They escaped from Vienna. They were also, you know, Holocaust survivors. But... He, I had a great connection. I was married 53 years. I have two wonderful children, my daughter. I have my son, Andrew, wife, Susan, Theo, Nicholas, Julian, three boys. I mean, I have a little family. Otherwise, I have nobody. So, and my son, what was my daughter who brought it to the front so that we could all find out what it was. Otherwise, we'd be still in that vault scribbled on those little pieces of paper it's like notebook you know it's a thick thick notebook 700 pages and it should go to the archives they wanted to take it at the holocaust museum in washington dc they closed the door they got together <laughs> and they called us and they said you know ddd 
maybe you could. Uh, yeah. But you know, I wasn't ready to give it up. It's just too hard. It's too hard. But I had a life here. I was a teacher in New York City, 27 years. I forgot about my career. Here I am. <laughs> Again, I, remind you. <laughs> I, 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 um, I wanted to ask if you ever, once you moved back, thought about revisiting your acting career. <laughs> How can I at my age? I would have loved it. But, you know, our life was very hard when you arrive in a strange country. It's a country of milk and honey. Yes. But, you know. Uh, it's very hard. I wanted to, uh, going back to Renya's diary, I wanted to go back and say, reading it myself, what an incredible writer, what a beautiful poet. She had so much promise. And like you, to reiterate what you said, how she found the beauty in these things. And one thing that struck me and that made it so devastating to read is that, you, especially from the beginning to the end, that you see her she's just a normal teenager she's talking about crushes on boys that she had grown to, up for her age very mature for her age um her relationship with zygmunt how he maybe played a little hard to get but also her girlfriends she was friends with them one day and then they were in an argument these are all things that teenagers these days that, that everybody that goes through and experiences my before i start taking questions from the viewers what is something, if you had to say something to young people today in today's world? They can what, change the world. They can, and what they can learn from your experience and, and, and Renny's experience, what do you have to say to young people today? Well, I want to say, I love the young people. I, was, I love children. I was teaching a long time. And the children have the power. The youth has the power to help the world. They need not to have nationalism. They need to have acceptance, tolerance, love thy neighbor as thyself. Please, you know, don't hate the Jews. The Jews are decent people. They're the same as the Christian are decent people. The Muslim. Please be tolerant because this hatred in the world, it doesn't do any good. It's only bloodshed. In America now we have too many guns. Too many kids are dying. Why? It's not fair. It's not fair. I would love the children. I wish when my mother sang, when they sang God bless America, my mom cried. So did I. They gave us a home. We had no home, nothing. And now we're here. I have children. They took us. It was great. It's the best thing. So the young people, they can do a lot. They have the strength. They have the youth. They have the energy. They can help the world. They just have to look at it and see that there should be more tolerance. That's what I like. You are absolutely an incredible woman and a beautiful person inside and out. And I'm so honored to speak with you. I think we're going to take a couple of minutes. My daughter. <laughs> And your daughter, yes. You both and my son, who was on the Zoom today. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to take a couple of questions from the viewers. Um, this is from Joanna. Can you talk about when, did, when you reconnected with Judaism after living life as a Catholic? And was that an easy transition? And what was that for you? I don't know. I was so confused. You know, I... I was totally confused. I went to Catholic schools. I went to Catholic church. You know, I did go to synagogue as a child, but that was long ago. I still, I don't know what it is. I just live now. I just want people to love each other. I don't care if, you know, so much about religion now, because, you know, the, which religious saved me? Right? So, you know, you ask yourself these questions. What is it? Why do they not, you know, save me as a Jew? I had to be Catholic to save me. It's very confusing. I was young. It was terrible. I can't even fathom. I, I didn't know what I was doing, basically. I wasn't brought up Catholic. I was a young kid, a Jewish family. Right. 
very okay. hard, very Absolutely. hard, confusing. Another question that we have was, how old was your mother when you were reunited and what kind of life did your mother live in the US after the war? Oh, my mother had a very hard life. She had two jobs and uh, she was, she died, now let me see. 69. Uh, she was 63 years old. She died. She died in 19 what? 69. 69. But when we arrived, she was what? And she must have been in her 30s, right? And uh, she had a very hard time. We first went to this family. They had the Belier. It was in uh, New Rochelle. They had a black woman, uh, African-American would say, that was a housekeeper. And they had a good life. The son went to Princeton. They met us at the boat. We came with Marina Merlin, was winter time, December of 46, shortly after the war, because my mom could get the papers working for the Americans. And uh, so we, we, we were there for two weeks and we were on our own. My uncle from France sent my mother a little money. It was very hard start. It was very difficult. And uh, we didn't have anybody because they, you know, they we stayed there and then we were on our own. So it was very hard, our life. It wasn't easy. And I she worked in the bank. Then she worked as a dietitian. And then she married an American, eight-generation American, Clyde Gardner, upstate New York, where she died in Saugerties. She was very young. Yes. 63. Um, when you, um, when you came to the U.S., cause after being through all of these atrocities and traumatic experiences, did you ever really sense, feel a sense of normal or calm once you got to the U.S.? I was a kid. I didn't know it was awful on that boat. It was winter time. It was a little crunchy boat. Everybody was dying. Please stay for a minute. Don't go for a minute. <laughs> Those old people, they couldn't stand it. And, you know, I, I mean, I was very happy that I was liberated, that I didn't have the burden of being the Jew being shot. You know, that was my freedom here. And it was a great country. They didn't have guns like now. So it was great. It was wonderful. So we were free now. And we had some kind of a home. We didn't know yet, but my mother had to look for the jobs and for school. We didn't have a place to live. You know, it was very hard. Um, and, and, one, and another question. Uh, so Zygmunt brought you the diary. What was your relationship with him like after that? Did, did you stay in contact with him? Did you have a relationship? Okay, he was, I have pictures. The thing was that I went to his daughter's wedding. She's very nice, Pamela Schwarzer. I went, now he had the best friend. His name was Maciek Tuchman. He also became a doctor. He was a doctor at NYU for 50 years. I was very close. He was actually my doctor. I went to him. He always called me Arianka when I went to the office because he went to school with my sister. He had also had a crush on my sister. But uh, you know, Zygmunt was a wonderful guy. His wife didn't want to see me. Remember, my sister, he had a shrine somewhere in the basement, picture of my sister. She didn't want to be reminded. They invited us for dinner once. I went to the daughter's wedding. I went to the bar mitzvah of Marcel's two children. But, you know, he couldn't, but I, I did see him once in a while, did see him, but not very often, you know, because but he invited me to the house. It was difficult with the wife, you understand. Yes, I, it's so incredibly hard and complex and complicated. Um, uh, I'm just looking at some of the questions. <laughs> in Heidelberg, you met her. 
and they got married. He went to school in Heidelberg with Marcel, Sigmund Schwarz. The Germans let the Jews, you know, from the camps, they let them free education. They became both doctors there. I, I think I remember reading about him in Renya's diary, actually. Um, and I and her talking about how there was a moment where maybe she was she was wondering if there might be something there, but there wasn't, that she was ultimately in love with Sigmund. And also her poetry and her talking about Sigmund when she was in the ghetto. I mean, but that that it's just the way she found beauty in everything. And I highly recommend anyone, please, please, please read this diary. Please read this diary. It is so <laughs> an important piece of work and of history. And it's incredible to think about, um, you know, her poetry and, and people I just- trouble. Yes, I, um, I, I just, her poetry is so profound, especially for someone of her age and her understanding of the world for someone her age, but then again, she she had to because of the circumstances that she was in. And I'm just, I am so honored that you were willing to speak with me today and share your story. I'm honored to have you. How is that? <laughs> You're such a you wonderful actress. Look at that. You're going to be famous, right? In the movies. <laughs> <laughs> you are so, so, so sweet. From your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> as they uh -huh. And Mr. Goldstein, very nice to see you too. Yes, thank you so much for having me also to the museum for having me. It's my absolute, it's my absolute honor and just thank you so incredibly much. <laughs> thank you for inviting me and my daughter. And on behalf of the museum, deep thanks to you, Stephanie, for hosting and, and interviewing Elizabeth today and you, Elizabeth, for sharing your story and Alexandra for making all of this possible. Um, I, to reaffirm, Stephanie's point, the diary is amazing. We really encourage you to read it. And there, there's a link in the chat. We did record today's program. So we will email you tomorrow with a copy of the recording, as well as a link that you can order Randy's diary at and some other resources, including a terrific article in Smithsonian Magazine about uh, how the diary was resurfaced in a little bit more detail. Uh, everything that we do at the museum is made possible through donor support. So to those of you watching who are members or donors at the museum, thank you. Uh, and if you're not, we hope you'll consider making a donation to support our work. Alexandra said it beautifully earlier that our mission is to preserve these stories um, so that future generations never forget and, and learn those lessons to help build a more, a more tolerant world. So uh, we do our best and, and we are grateful that all of you join us in that. We do have a, a robust schedule of programs and events, including two programs this week. Our next story, Survive program is on May 27th. You can find all of that information on our website, which is also in the Zoom chat. Uh, a very happy Mother's Day to everyone and a big thank you. Happy Mother's Day. Bye. Good luck. <laughs> thank you. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Bye. <laughs>